This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com. The, the Flying Inn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zernaz. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. The Inn Finds Wings. Mr. Humphrey Pump stood in front of his inn once more. The clean and loaded gun still lay on the table, and the white sign of the ship still swung in the slight sea breeze over his head. But his leatherish features were knotted over a new problem. He held two letters in his hand, letters of a very different sort, but letters that pointed to the same difficult problem. The first ran, Dear Hump, I am so bothered that I simply must call you by the old name again. You understand, I have got to keep in with my people. Lord Ivywood is a sort of cousin of mine, and for that and for some other reasons my poor old mother would just die if I offended him. You know, her heart is weak. You know everything there is to know in this county. Well, I only write to warn you that something is going to be done against your dear old inn. I don't know what these countries coming to. Only a month or two ago I saw a shabby old pantaloon on the beach with a green gamp, talking the craziest stuff you ever heard in your life. Three weeks ago I heard he was lecturing at ethical societies, whatever they are, for a handsome salary. Well, when I was last at Ivywood, I must go because Mama likes it. There was the living lunatic again, in evening dress and talking about people who really know, I mean who know better. Lord Ivywood is entirely under his influence and thinks him the greatest prophet the world has ever seen. And Lord Ivywood is not a fool. One can't help admire him. Mama, I think, wants me to do more than admire him. I am telling you everything, Hump, because I think perhaps this is the last honest letter I shall ever write in the world. And I warn you seriously that Lord Ivywood is sincere, which is perfectly terrible. He will be the biggest English statesman and he does really mean to ruin the old ships. If you ever see me here again taking part in such work, I hope you may forgive me. Somebody we mentioned whom I shall never see again. I leave to your friendship. It is the second best thing I can give, and I am not sure it may be better than the first would have been. Goodbye, J.B. This letter seemed to distress Mr. Pump rather than puzzle him. It ran as follows. Sir, the Committee of the Imperial Commission of Liqueur Control is directed to draw your attention to the fact that you have disregarded the Committee's communications under Section 5A of the Act for the regulation of places of public entertainment, and that you are now under Section 47C of the Act, amending the Act for the regulation of places of public entertainment aforesaid. The charges on which prosecution will be founded are as follows. Violation of subsection 23 of the Act, which enacts that no pictorial signs shall be exhibited before premises of less than the rateable value of £2,000 per annum. Violation of subsection 113 of the Act, which enacts that no liqueur containing alcohol shall be sold in any inn, hotel, tavern, or public house, except when demanded under a medical certificate from one of the doctors licensed by the State Medical Council, or in the specially accepted cases of Claridge's Hotel and the Criterion Bar, where urgency has already been improved. As you have failed to acknowledge previous communications on this subject, this is to warn you that legal steps will be taken immediately. We are yours truly, Ivy Wood President, J. Levison Secretary. Mr. Humphrey Pump sat down at the table outside his inn and whistled in a way which, combined with his little whiskers, made him for the moment seem literally like an ostler. Then the very real wit and learning he had returned slowly into his face, and with his warm brown eyes he considered the cold grey sea. There was not much to be got out of the sea. Humphrey Pump might drown himself in the sea, which would be better for Humphrey Pump than being finally separated from the old ship. England might be sunk under the sea, which would be better for England than never again having such places as the old ship. But these were not serious remedies nor rationally attainable, and Pump could only feel that the sea had simply warped him as it had warped his apple trees. The sea was a dreary business altogether. There was only one figure walking on the sands. It was only when the figure drew nearer and nearer and grew to more than human size that he sprang to his feet with a cry. Also the leveled light of morning lit the man's hair and it was red. The late king of Ithaca came casually and slowly up the slope of the beach that led to the old ship, 
he had landed in a boat from a battleship that could still be seen near the horizon and he still wore the astounding uniform of apple green and silver which he had himself invented as that of a navy that had never existed much and which now did not exist at all he had a straight naval sword at his side for terms of his capitulation had never required him to surrender it and inside the uniform and beside the sword there was what there always had been a big and rather bewildered man with rough red hair whose misfortune was that he had good brains but that his bodily strength and bodily passions were a little too strong for his brains he had flung his crashing weight on the chair outside the inn before the innkeeper could find words to express his astounded pleasure in seeing him his first words were have you got any rum then as a feeling that his attitude needed explanation he added i suppose i shall never be a sailor again after to-night so i must have rum humphrey pump had a talent for friendship and understood his old friend he went into the inn without word and came back idly pushing or rolling with an alternate foot as if he were playing football with two balls at once two objects that rolled very easily one was a big keg or barrel of rum and the other a great solid drum of cheese among his thousand other technical tricks he had a way of tapping a cask without a tap or anything that could impair its revolutionary or revolving qualities he was feeling in his pocket for the instrument with which he solved such questions when his irish friend suddenly sat bolt upright as one startled out of sleep and spoke with his strongest and most unusual brogue oh thank you hump a thousand times and i don't really think i wanted something to drink at all now that i know that i can have it i don't seem to want it at all but what i do want and he suddenly dashed his big fist on the little table so that one of its legs lifted and nearly snapped what i do want is some sort of account of what's happening in this england of yours that shan't be obviously just rubbish ah said pump fingering the two letters thoughtfully and what do you mean by rubbish i call it rubbish cried patrick delroy when you put the koran into the bible and not the apopha and i call it rubbish when a mad parson's allowed to propose to put a crescent on st paul's cathedral i know the turks are our allies now but they often were before and i never heard that palmerston or colin campbell had any truck with such trash lord ivywood is very enthusiastic i know said pump with a restrained amusement he was saying only the other day at the flower show here that the time had come for a full unity between christianity and islam something called chrislam perhaps said the irishman with a moody eye he was gazing across the grey and purple woodbines that is stretched below them at the back of the inn and into which the steep white road swept downwards and disappeared the steep road looked like the beginning of an adventure and he was an adventurer but you exaggerate you know went on pump polishing his gun about the crescent on st paul's it wasn't exactly that what dr mool suggested i think was some sort of double emblem you know combining cross and crescent and carl the crescent muttered delroy and you can't call dr mool a parson either went on mr humphrey pump polishing industriously why they say he's a sort of atheist or what they call an agnostic like a squire brunton who used to bite elm trees by marley the grand folks have these fashions captain but they have never lasted long that i know of i think it's serious this time said his friend shaking his big red head this is the last inn on this coast and will be soon the last inn in england do you remember saracen's head in plumsea along the shore there i know assented the innkeeper my aunt was there when he hanged his mother but it's a charming place i passed there just now and it has been destroyed said delroy destroyed by fire asked pump pausing in his gun scrubbing no said delroy destroyed by lemonade they've taken away its license or whatever they call it i made a song about it which i'll sing to you now and with an astounding air of suddenly revived spirits he roared in a voice like thunder the following verses to a simple but spirited tune of his own invention the saracen's head looks down the lane where we shall never drink wine again for the wicked old women who feel well bred have turned to a tea shop the saracen's head the saracen's head out of Araby came king richard riding in arms like flame and where he established his folk to be fed he set up his spear and the saracen's head but the saracen's head outlived the kings it thought in it thought of most horrible things of health and of soap and of standard bread and of saracen drinks at the saracen's head hello cried pump with another low whistle 
why here comes his lordship and i suppose that young man in the goggles is a committee or something let him come said dilroy and continued in a yet more earthquake bellow so the saracen's head fulfills its name they drink no wine it's a ridiculous game and i shall wonder until i'm dead how it ever came into the saracen's head as the last echo of this lyrical roar rolled away among the apple trees and down the steep white road into the woods captain delroy leaned back in his chair and nodded good-humouredly to lord ivywood who was standing on the lawn with his usual cold air but with slightly compressed lips behind him was a dark young man with double eye-glasses and a number of printed papers in his hand presumably j levison secretary in the road outside stood a small group of three which struck pump as strangely incongruous like a group in a three-act farce the first was a police inspector in uniform the second was a workman in leather apron more or less like a carpenter and the third was an old man in a scarlet turkish fez but otherwise dressed in very fashionable english clothes in which he did not seem very comfortable he was explaining something about the end to the policeman and the carpenter who appeared to be restraining their amusement fine song that my lord said delroy with cheerful egotism i'll sing you another and he cleared his throat mr pump said lord ivywood in his bell-like and beautiful voice i thought i would come in person if only to make it clear that every indulgence has been shown to you the mere date of this thing brings it within the statute of nineteen o nine it was erected when my great-grandfather was lord of the manor here though i believe it then bore a different name and ah my lord broke in pump with a sigh i'd rather deal with your great-grandfather i would though he married a hundred negresses instead of one than see a gentleman of your family taking away a poor man's livelihood the act is specially designed in the interests of the relief of poverty proceeded lord ivywood in an unruffled manner and its final advantages will accrue to all citizens alike he turned for an instant to the dark secretary saying you have the second report and received a folded paper in answer it is here fully explained said lord ivywood putting on his elderly eyeglasses that the purpose of the act is largely to protect the savings of the more humble and necessitous classes i find in paragraph three we strongly advise that the deleterious element of alcohol be made illegal save in such places as the government may especially exempt for parliamentary or other public reasons and that the provocative and demoralizing display on ensigns be strictly forbidden except in cases thus especially exempted the absence of such temptations will in our opinion do much to improve the precarious financial conditions of the working class that disposes i think of any such suggestion as mr pump's that our inevitable acts of social reform are in any sense oppressive to mr pump's prejudice it may appear for the moment to bear hardly upon him but and here lord ivywood's voice took one of its moving oratorical turns what better proof could we desire of the insidiousness of the sleepy poison we denounce what better evidence could we offer of the civic corruption that we seek to cure than the very fact that good and worthy men of established repute in the county can by having in such places as these become so stagnant and sodden and unsocial whether through the fumes of wine or through meditations as modelled about the past that they consider the case solely as their own case and laugh at the long agony of the poor captain delroy had been studying ivywood with the very bright blue eye and he spoke now much more quietly than he generally did excuse me one moment my lord he said but there was one point in your important explanation which i am not sure i have got right do i understand you to say that though signboards are to be generally abolished yet where if anywhere they are retained the right to sell fermented liqueur will be retained also in other words though an englishman may at last find only one ensign left in england yet if the place has an ensign it will also have your gracious permission to be really an inn lord ivywood had an admirable command of temper which had helped him much in his career as a statesman he did not waste time in wrangling about the captain's locus stand in the matter he replied quite simply yes your statement of the facts is correct whenever i find an ensign permitted by the police i may go in and ask for a glass of beer also permitted by the police 
if you find any such yes answered ivywood quite temperately but we hope soon to have removed them altogether captain patrick delroy rose enormously from his seat with a sort of a stretch and yawned well hump he said to his friend the best thing it seems to me is to take the important things with us with two side staggering kicks he sent the keg of rum and the rolled cheese flying over the fence in such a direction that they bolted on the descending road and rolled more and more rapidly toward the dark woods into which the path disappeared then he gripped the pole of the ensign shook it twice and plucked it out of the turf like a tuft of grass it had all happened before any one could move but as he strode out into the road the policeman ran forward delroy smacked him flat across the face and chest with the wooden signboard so as to send him flying into the ditch on the other side of the road then turning on to the man in the fez he poked him with the end of the pole so sharply in his new white waistcoat and watch chain as to cause him to sit down suddenly in the road looking very serious and thoughtful the dark secretary made a movement of rescue but humphrey pump with a cry caught up his gun from the table and pointed it at him which so alarmed J. Levison's secretary as to cause him to almost double up with his emotions. The next moment, Pump, with his gun under his arm, was scampering down the hill after the captain, who was scampering after the barrel and the cheese. Before the policeman had struggled out of the ditch, they had all disappeared into the darkness of the forest. Lord Ivywood, who had remained firm through the scene, without a sign of fear or impatience, or I will add, amusement, held up his hand and stopped the policeman in his pursuit. We should only make ourselves and the law look ridiculous, he said, by pursuing those ludicrous rowdies, no? They can't escape or do any real harm in the state of modern communications. What is far more important, gentlemen, is to destroy their stores and their base. Under the Act of 1911, we have a right to confiscate and destroy any property in an inn where the law has been violated. And he stood for hours on the lawn, watching the smashing of bottles and the breaking up of casks, and feeding on fanatical pleasure. The pleasure his strange, cold, courageous nature could not get from food or wine or women. End of The Inn Finds Wings Recording by Zernaz This is ChestertonRadio.com Chapter 5 of The Flying Inn this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter 5 The Astonishment of the Agents. Lord Ivywood shared the mental weakness of most men who have fed on books. He ignored not the value, but the very existence of other forms of information. Thus Humphrey Pump was perfectly aware that Lord Ivywood considered him an ignorant man who carried a volume of Pickwick and could not be got to read any other book but lord ivywood was quite unaware that humphrey never looked at him without thinking that he could be most successfully hidden in a wood of small beeches as his grey-brown hair and sallow ashen face exactly reproduced the three predominant tints of such a sylvan twilight mr pump i fear had sometimes partaken of partridge or pheasant in his early youth under circumstances in which lord ivywood was not only unconscious of the hospitality he was dispensing but would have sworn that it was physically impossible for any one to elude the vigilance of his efficient system of gamekeeping but it is very unwise in one who counts himself superior to physical things to talk about physical impossibility. Lord Ivywood was in error, therefore, when he said that the fugitives could not possibly escape in modern England. You can do a great many things in modern England, if you have noticed. 
some things in fact which others know by pictures or current speech if you know for instance that most roadside hedges are taller and denser than they look and that even the largest man lying just behind them takes up far less room than you would suppose if you know that many natural sounds are much more like each other than the enlightened ear can believe as in the case of wind in leaves and of the sea if you know that it is easier to walk in socks than in boots if you know how to take hold of the ground if you know that the proportion of dogs who will bite a man under any circumstances is rather less than the proportion of men who will murder you in a railway carriage if you know that you need not be drowned even in a river unless the tide is very strong and unless you practise putting yourself into the special attitudes of a suicide if you know that country stations have objectless extra waiting rooms that nobody ever goes into and if you know that country folk will forget you if you speak to them but talk about you all day if you don't by the exercise of these and other arts and sciences humphrey pump was able to guide his friend across country mostly in the character of trespasser and occasionally in that of something like housebreaker and eventually with sign keg cheese and all to step out of a black pine wood on to a white road in a part of the country where they would not be sought for the present opposite them was a cornfield and on their right in the shades of the pine trees a cottage a very tumble-down cottage that seemed to have collapsed under its own thatch the red-haired irishman's face wore a curious smile he stuck the ensign erect in the road and went and hammered on the door it was opened tremulously by an old man with a face so wrinkled that the wrinkles seemed more distinctly graven than the features themselves which seemed lost in the labyrinth of them he might have crawled out of the hole in a gnarled tree and he might have been a thousand years old he did not seem to notice the signboard which stood rather to the left of the door and what life remained in his eyes seemed to awake in wonder at dalroy's stature and strange uniform and the sword at his side i beg your pardon said the captain courteously i fear my uniform startles you it is lord ivywood's livery all his servants are to dress like this in fact i understand the tenants also and even yourself perhaps excuse my sword lord ivywood is very particular that every man should have a sword you know his beautiful eloquent way of putting his views how can we profess he was saying to me yesterday while i was brushing his trousers how can we profess that all men are brothers while we refuse to them the symbol of manhood or with what assurance can we claim it as a movement of modern emancipation to deny the citizen that which has in all ages marked the difference between the free man and the slave nor need we anticipate any such barbaric abuses as my honourable friend who is cleaning the knives has prophesied for this gift is a sublime act of confidence in your universal passion for the severe splendours of peace and he that has the right to strike is he who has learnt to spare 
talking all this nonsense with extreme rapidity and vast oratorical flourishes of the hand captain dalroy proceeded to trundle both the big cheese and the cask of rum into the house of the astonished cottager mr pump following with a grim placidity and his gun under his arm lord ivywood said dalroy setting the rum cask with a bump on the plain deal table wishes to take wine with you or more strictly speaking rum don't you run away my friend with any of these stories about lord ivywood being opposed to drink three bottle ivywood we call him in the kitchen but it must be rum nothing but rum for the ivywoods wine may be a mocker he was saying the other day and i particularly noted the phrasing which seemed to be very happy even for his lordship he was standing at the top of the steps and i stopped cleaning them to make a note of it wine may be a mocker strong drink may be raging but nowhere in the sacred pages will you find one word of censure of the sweeter spirit sacred to them that go down to the sea in ships no tongue of priest and prophet has ever lifted to break the sacred silence of holy writ about rum he then explained to me went on dalroy signing to pump to tap the cask according to his own technical secret that the great tip for avoiding any bad results that a bottle or two of rum might have on young and inexperienced people was to eat cheese with it particularly this kind of cheese that i have here i've forgotten its name cheddar said pump quite gravely but mind you continued the captain almost ferociously shaking his big finger in warning at the aged man mind you no bread with the cheese all the devastating ruin wrought by cheese and the once happy homes of this country has been due to the reckless and insane experiment of eating bread with it you'll get no bread from me my friend indeed lord ivywood has given directions that the allusion to this ignorant and depraved habit shall be eliminated from the lord's prayer have a drink he had already poured out a little of the spirit into two thick tumblers and a broken teacup which he had induced the aged man to produce and now solemnly pledged him thank ye kindly sir said the old man using his cracked voice for the first time then he drank and his old face changed as if it were an old horn lantern in which the flame began to rise ah he said my son he be a sailor i wish him a happy voyage said the captain and i'll sing you a song about the first sailor there ever was in the world and who as lord ivywood acutely observes lived before the time of rum he sat down on a wooden chair and lifted his loud voice once more beating on the table with the broken teacup old noah he had an ostrich farm and fowls on the greatest scale he ate his egg with a ladle in an egg cup big as a pail and the soup he took was elephant soup and the fish he took was whale but they all were small to the cellar he took when he set out to sail and noah he often said to his wife when he sat down to dine i don't care where the water goes if it doesn't get into the wine the cataract of the cliff of heaven fell blinding off the brink as if it would wash the stars away as suds go down a sink the seven heavens came roaring down for the throats of hell to drink and noah he cocked his eye and said 
it looks like rain i think the water has drowned the matter horn as deep as a mendip wine and i don't care where the water goes if it doesn't get into the wine but noah he sinned and we have sinned on tipsy feet we trod till a great big black teetotaler was sent to us for a rod and you can't get wine at a psa or chapel or iced at fod for the curse of water has come again because of the wrath of god and water is on the bishop's board and the higher thinker's shrine but i don't care where the water goes if it doesn't get into the wine lord avywood's favorite song concluded mr patrick dalroy drinking sing us a song yourself rather to the surprise of the two humorists the old gentleman actually began in a quavering voice to chant king george that lives in london town i hope they will defend his crown and bony park be quite put down on christmas day in the morning old squire is gone to the meet to-day all in his it is perhaps fortunate for the rapidity of this narrative that the old gentleman's favorite song which consists of forty-seven verses was interrupted by a curious incident the door of the cottage opened and a sheepish-looking man in corduroys stood silently in the room for a few seconds and then said without preface or further explanation for ale i beg your pardon inquired the polite captain for ale said the man with solidity then catching sight of humphrey seemed to find a few more words in his vocabulary morning mr pump didn't know as how you'd move the old ship mr pump with a twist of a smile pointed to the old man whose song had been interrupted mr mames seeing after it now mr gow said pump with the strict etiquette of the countryside but he's got nothing but this rum in stock as yet better now said the laconic mr gow and put down some money in front of the aged mame who eyed it wonderingly as he was turning with a farewell and wiping his mouth with the back of his hand the door once more moved letting in white sunlight and a man in a red neckerchief morning mr mame morning mr pump morning mr gow said the man in the red neckerchief morning mr coot said the other three one after the other have some rum mr coot asked humphrey pump genially that's all mr mame's got just now mr coot also had a little rum and, and also laid a little money under the rather vague gaze of the venerable cottager mr coot was just proceeding to explain that these were bad times but if you saw a sign you were all right still a lawyer up at grunton abbott had told him so when the company was increased and greatly excited by the arrival of a boisterous and popular tinker who ordered glasses all round and said he had his donkey and cart outside a prolonged rich and confused conversation about the donkey and cart then ensued in which the most varied views were taken of their merits and it gradually began to dawn on dalroy that the tinker was trying to sell them an idea suited to the romantic opportunism of his present absurd career suddenly swept over his mind and he rushed out to look at the cart and donkey the next moment he was back again asking the tinker what his price was 
and almost in the same breath offering a much bigger price than the tinker would have dreamed of asking this was considered however as a lunacy especially allowed to gentlemen the tinker had some more rum on the strength of the payments and then dalroy offering his excuses sealed up the cask and took it and the cheese to be stowed in the bottom of the cart the money however he still left lying in shining silver and copper before the silver beard of old Maine. no one acquainted with the quaint and often wordless camaraderie of the english poor will require to be told that they all went out and stared at him as he loaded the cart and saw to the harness of the donkey all except the old cottager who sat as if hypnotized by the sight of the money while they were standing there they saw coming down the white hot road where it curled over the hill a figure that gave them no pleasure even when it was a mere marching black spot in the distance it was a mr bullrose the agent of lord ivywood's estates mr bullrose was a short square man with a broad square head with ridges of close black curls on it with a heavy frog-like face and starting suspicious eyes a man with a good silk hat but a square business jacket mr bullrose was not a nice man the agent on that sort of estate hardly ever is a nice man the landlord often is and even lord ivywood had an arctic magnanimity of his own which made most people want if possible to see him personally but mr bullrose was petty every really practical tyrant must be petty he evidently failed to understand the commotion in front of mr mame's partly collapsed cottage but he felt there must be something wrong about it he wanted to get rid of the cottage altogether and had not of course the faintest intention of giving the cottager any compensation for it he hoped the old man would die but in any case he could easily clear him out if it became suddenly necessary for he could not possibly pay the rent for this week the rent was not very much but it was immeasurably too much for the old man who had no conceivable way of borrowing or earning it that is where the chivalry of our aristocratic land system comes in good-bye my friends the enormous man in the fantastic uniform was saying all roads lead to rum as lord ivywood said in one of his gayer moments and we hope to be back soon establishing a first-class hotel here of which prospectuses will soon be sent out the heavy frog-like face of mr bullrose the agent grew uglier with astonishment and the eyes stood out more like a snail's than a frog's the indefensible allusion to lord ivywood would in any case have caused a choleric intervention if it had not been swallowed up in the earthquake suggestion of an unlicensed hotel on the estate this again would have affected the explosion if that and everything else had not been struck still and rigid by the sight of a solid wooden signpost already erected outside old mame's miserable cottage 
"'I've got him now,' muttered Mr. Bullrose. "'He can't possibly pay, and out he shall go.' And he walked swiftly towards the door of the cottage. Almost at the same moment that Dalroy went to the donkey's head, as if to lead it off along the road. "'Look here, my man!' burst out Mr. Bullrose the instant he was inside the cottage. "'You've cooked yourself this time. His lordship has been a great deal too indulgent with you. But this is going to be the end of it. The insolence of what you've done outside, especially when you know his lordship's wishes in such things, has just put the lid on.' He stopped a moment and sneered. "'So unless you happen to have the exact rent down to a farthing or two about you, out you go we're sick of your sort in a very awkward and fumbling manner the old man pushed a heap of coins across the table mr bullrose sat down suddenly on the wooden chair with his silk hat on and began counting them furiously he counted them once he counted them twice and he counted them again then he stared at them more steadily than the cottager had done. "'Where did you get this money?' he asked in a thick, gross voice. "'Did you steal it?' "'I ain't very spry for stealing,' said the old man in quavering comedy. Bullrose looked at him and then at the money, and remembered with fury that Ivywood was a just, though cold, magistrate on the bench. "'Well, anyhow,' he cried in a hot, heady way, we got enough against you to turn you out of this. Haven't you broken the law, my man, to say nothing of the regulations for tenants?' in sticking up that fancy sign of yours outside the cottage eh the tenant was silent eh reiterated the agent ah replied the tenant have you or have you not a signboard outside this house shouted bullrose hammering the table the tenant looked at him for a long time with a patient and venerable face, and then said, Maybe yes, maybe no. I'll mubby you, cried Mr. Bullrose, springing up and sticking his silk hat on the back of his head. I don't know whether you people are too drunk to see anything, but I saw the thing with my own eyes out in the road. Come out, and deny it if you dare. Arr, said Mr. Mame dubiously. He tottered after the agent, who flung open the door with a business-like fury and stood outside on the threshold. He stood there quite a long time, and he did not speak. Deep in the hardened mud of his materialistic mind, there had stirred two things that were its ancient enemies. The old fairy tale, in which everything can be believed, the new skepticism, in which nothing can be believed, not even one's own eyes. There was no sign, nor sign of a fane in the landscape. On the withered face of the old man Mame, there was a faint renewal of that laughter that has slept since the Middle Ages. End of chapter 5
Recording by Bill Mosley, Frelsburg, Texas, USA. Chapter 6 of The Flying Inn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter 6 The Hole in Heaven. That delicate ruby light, which is one of the rarest but one of the most exquisite of evening effects, warmed the land, sky, and seas as if the whole world were washed in wine, and dyed almost scarlet the strong red head of Patrick Dalroy, as he stood on a waste of firs and bracken, where he and his friends had halted. One of his friends was re-examining a short gun, rather like a double-barreled carbine, the other was eating thistles. Dalroy himself was idle and ruminant, with his hands in his pockets and his eye on the horizon. Landwards the hills, plains, and woods lay bathed in the rose-red light, but it changed somewhat to purple, to cloud and something like storm over the distant violet strip of sea. It was toward the sea that he was staring. Suddenly he woke up, and seemed almost to rub his eyes, or at any rate to rub his red eyebrow. "'Why, we're on the road of Pebblewick,' he said. "'That's the damned little tin chapel by the beach.' "'I know,' answered his friend and guide. "'We've done the old hair trick, doubled, you know. Nine times out of ten it's the best. Parson White Lady used to do it when they were after him for dog-stealing.' I've pretty much followed his trail. You can't do better than stick to the best examples. They tell you, in London, that Dick Turpin rode to York. Well, I know he didn't, for my old grandfather, up at Cobble's End, knew the Turpins intimately, threw one of them into the river on a Christmas day. But I think I can guess what he did do, and how the tale got about. If Dick was wise— he went flying up the old north road, shouting, York, York, or what not, before people recognized him. Then, if he did the thing properly, he might, half an hour afterwards, walk down the strand with a pipe in his mouth. They say old Boney said, Go where you aren't expected. And I suppose, as a soldier, he was right. But for a gentleman dodging the police, like yourself, it isn't exactly the right way of putting it. I should say— go where you ought to be expected, and you'll generally find your fellow creatures don't do what they ought about expecting any more than about anything else. "'Well, this bit between here and the sea,' said the captain, in a brown study, "'I know it so well, so well, that, that I rather wish I'd never seen it again. Do you know?' he asked, suddenly pointing to a patch and pit of sand, that showed white in the dusky heath a hundred yards away. Do you know what makes that spot so famous in history? Yes, answered Mr. Pump. That's where old Mother Grouch shot the Methodist. You are in error, said the captain. Such an incident as you describe would in no case call for special comment or regret. No, that spot is famous, because a very badly brought-up girl once lost a ribbon off a plate of black hair, and somebody helped her find it. "'Has the other person been well brought up?' asked Pump, with a faint smile. "'No,' said Dalroy, staring at the sea. "'He has been brought down.' Then rousing himself again, he made a gesture toward a further part of the heath. "'Do you know the remarkable history of that old wall, the one beyond the last gorge over there?' "'No,' replied the other, "'unless you mean Dead Man's Circus.' that happened further along. I do not mean Dead Man's Circus, said the captain. The remarkable history of that wall is that somebody's shadow once fell on it, and that shadow was more desirable than the substance of all other living things. It is this, he cried almost violently, resuming his flippant tone, it is this circumstance, Hump, and not the trivial and everyday incident of a dead man going to a circus to which you have presumed to compare it. It is this historical event 
which Lord Ivywood is about to commemorate by rebuilding the wall, with solid gold and Greek marble stolen by the Turks from the grave of Socrates, enclosing a column of solid gold four hundred feet high and surmounted by a colossal equestrian statue of a bankrupt Irishman riding backwards on a donkey. He lifted one of his long legs over the animal, as if about to pose for the group, then swung back on both feet again, and again looked at the purple limit of the sea. "'Do you know, Hump?' he said. "'I think modern people have somehow got their minds all wrong about human life. They seem to expect what nature has never promised, and then try to ruin all that nature has really given. At all those atheist chapels of ivy-woods, they're always talking of peace, perfect peace, and utter peace, and universal joy, and souls that beat as one. But they don't look any more cheerful than anyone else, and the next thing they do is to start smashing a thousand good jokes, and good stories, and good songs, and good friendships by pulling down the old ship. He gave a glance at the loose signpost lying on the heath beside him, almost as if to reassure himself that it was not stolen. Now, it seems to me, he went on, that this is asking for too much and getting too little. I don't know whether God means a man to have happiness in that all-in-all -all and utterly utter sense of happiness, but God does mean a man to have a little fun, and I mean to go on having it. If I mustn't satisfy my heart, I can gratify my humor. The cynical fellows who think themselves so damned clever have a sort of saying, Be good and you will be happy, but you will not have a jolly time. The cynical fellows are quite wrong, as they generally are. They have got hold of the exact opposite of the truth. God knows I don't set up to be good. But even a rascal sometimes has to fight the world in the same way as a saint. I think I have fought the world. Et militavi non sine. What's the Latin for having a lark? I can't pretend to peace and joy and all the rest of it, particularly in this original briar patch. I haven't been happy, Hump, but I have had a jolly time. The sunset stillness settled down again, save for the cropping of the donkey in the undergrowth, and Pump said nothing sympathetically, and it was Dalroy once more who took up his parable. So, I think there's too much of this playing on our emotions, Hump, as this place is certainly playing the cat and banjo with mine. Damn it all, there are other things to do with the rest of one's time. I don't like all this fuss about feeling things. It only makes people miserable. In my present frame of mind, I'm in favor of doing things. All of which, Hump, he said with a sudden lift of the voice that always went in him with a rushing, irrational return of merely animal spirits, all of which I have put into a song against songs that I will now sing you. I shouldn't sing it here, said Humphrey Pump, picking up his gun and putting it under his arm. You look large in this open place, and you sound large, but I'll take you to the hole in heaven you've been talking about so much, and hide you as I used to hide you from that tutor. I couldn't catch his name, man who could only get drunk on Greek wine at Square Wimples. Hump! cried the captain. I abdicate the throne of Ithaca. You are far wiser than Ulysses. Here I have had my heart torn with temptations to ten thousand things between suicide and abduction, and all by the mere sight of that hole in the heath where we used to have picnics. And all that time I'd forgotten we used to call it the hole in heaven. And by God, what a good name, in both senses. I thought you'd have remembered it, Captain, said the innkeeper, from the joke young Mr. Matthews made. In the heat of some savage hand-to-hand -hand struggle in Albania, said Mr. Dalroy sadly, pressing his palm across his brow, I must have forgotten for one fatal instant the joke young Mr. Matthews made. It wasn't very good, said Mr. Pump simply. Ah, his aunt was the one for things like that. She went too far with old Gudgeon, though. With these words he jumped and seemed to be swallowed up by the earth but they had merely strolled the few yards needed to bring them to the edge of the sand-pit on the heath of which they had been speaking. And it is one of the truths concealed by heaven from Lord Ivywood, and revealed by heaven to Mr. Pump, that a hiding-place can be covered 
when you are close to it, and yet be open and visible from some spot of vantage far off. From the side by which they approached it, the sudden hollow of sand, a kind of collapsed chamber in the heath, seemed covered with a natural curve of fern and furze, and flashed out of sight like a fairy. "'It's all right,' he called out from under a floor or roof of leaves. "'You'll remember it all when you get there. This is the place to sing your song, Captain. Lord bless me, Captain, I don't remember your singing that Irish song you made up at college, bellowing it like a bull of Bashan, all about hearts and sleeves or some such thing, and her ladyship and the tutor never heard a breath, because that bank of sand breaks everything. It's worth knowing all this, you know. It's a pity it's not part of a young gentleman's education. Now, you shall sing me the song in favor of having no feelings, or whatever you call it. Dalroy was staring about him at the cavern of his old picnics, so forgotten and so startlingly familiar. He seemed to have lost all thought of singing anything, and simply to be groping in the dark house of his own boyhood. There was a slight trickle from a natural spring in the sandstone just under the ferns, and he remembered they used to try to boil the water in a kettle. He remembered a quarrel about who had upset the kettle, which, in the morbidity of first love, had given him for days the tortures of the damned. When the energetic pump broke once more through the rather thorny roof, on an impulse to accumulate their other eccentric possessions, Patrick remembered about a thorn in a finger that made his heart stop with something that was pain and perfect music. When pump returned with the rum keg and the cheese, and rolled them with a kick down the shelving sandy side of the hole, he remembered, with almost wrathful laughter, that in the old days he had rolled down that slope himself, and thought it rather a fine thing to do. He felt then as if he were rolling down a smooth side of the Matterhorn. He observed now that the height was rather less than that of the second story of one of the stunted cottages he had noted on his return. He suddenly understood he had grown bigger, bigger in a bodily sense, he had doubts about any other. "'The hole in heaven,' he said. "'What a good name! What a good poet I was in those days! The hole in heaven! But does it let one in or let one out?' In the last level shafts of the fallen sun, the fantastic shadow of the long-eared quadruped, whom Pump had now tethered to a new and nearer pasture, fell across the last sunlit scrap of sand. Dalroy looked at the long, exaggerated shadow of the ass, and laughed that short, explosive laugh he had uttered when the doors of the harems had been closed after the Turkish war. He was normally a man much too loquacious, but he never explained those laughs. Humphrey Pump plunged down again into the sunken nest, and began to broach the cask of rum in his own secret style, saying, "'We can get something else somehow tomorrow.' For tonight we can eat cheese and drink rum, especially as there's water on tap, so to speak. And now, Captain, sing us the song against songs. Patrick Dalroy drank a little rum out of a small medicine glass, which the generally unaccountable Mr. Pump unaccountably procured from his waistcoat pocket. But Patrick's color had risen. His brow was almost as red as his hair, and he was evidently reluctant. "'I don't see why I should sing all the songs,' he said. "'Why the devil don't you sing a song yourself? "'And now, come to think of it,' he cried, "'with an accumulating brogue, "'not perhaps wholly unaffected by the rum, "'which he had not, in fact, drunk for years. "'And now I come to think of it, "'what about that song of yours? "'All me youths coming back in this blessed and cursed place, "'and I remember that song of yours "'that never existed nor ever will. "'Don't you remember, Humphrey Pump?' That night when I sang ye no less than seventeen songs of me own composition? I remember it very well, answered the Englishman with restraint. And don't ye remember, went on the exhilarated Irishman with solemnity, that unless ye could produce a poetic lyric of your own, written and sung by yourself, I threatened to— To sing again, said the impenetrable pump. Yes, I know. 
he calmly proceeded to take out of his pockets which were alas more like those of a poacher than an innkeeper a folded and faded piece of paper i wrote it when you asked me he said simply i have never tried to sing it but i'll sing it myself when you've sung your song against anybody singing at all all right cried the somewhat excited captain to hear a song from you why i'll sing anything this is the song against songs hump and again he let his voice out like a bellow against the evening silence the song of the sorrow of melisande is a weary song and a dreary song the glory of mariana's grange had got into great decay the song of the raven never more has never been called a cheery song and the brightest things in baudelaire are anything else but gay but who will write us a riding song or a hunting song or a drinking song fit for them that arose and rode when day and the wine were red but bring me a quart of claret out and i will write you a clinking song a song of war and a song of wine and a song to wake the dead the song of the fury of frogolet is a florid song and a torrid song the song of the sorrow of tara is sung to a harp unstrung the song of the cheerful shropshire kid i consider a perfectly horrid song and the song of the happy futurist is a song that can't be sung but who will write us a riding song or a fighting song or a drinking song fit for the fathers of you and me that knew how to think and thrive but the song of beauty and art and love is simply an utterly stinking song to double you up and drag you down and damn your soul alive take some more rum concluded the irish officer affably and let's hear your song at last with the gravity inseparable from the deep conventionality of country people mr pump unfolded the paper on which he had recorded the only antagonistic emotion that was strong enough in him to screw his infinite english tolerance to the pitch of song he read out the title very carefully and in full song against grocers by humphrey pump sole proprietor of the old ship pebblewick good accommodation for man and beast celebrated as the house at which both queen charlotte and jonathan wilde put up on different occasions and where the ice-cream man is mistaken for bonaparte this song is written against grocers god made the wicked grocer for a mystery and a sign that men might shun the awful shops and go to inns and dine where the bacon's on the rafter and the wine is in the wood and god has made good laughter has seen that they are good the evil-hearted grocer would call his mother ma'am and bow at her and bob at her her aged soul to damn and rub his horrid hands and ask what article it was next though mortis in articulo should be her proper text his props are not his children but pert lads underpaid who call out cash and bang about to work his wicked trade he keeps a lady in a cage most cruelly all day and makes her count and calls her miss until she fades away the righteous minds of innkeepers induce them now and then to crack a bottle with a friend or treat unmoneyed men but who hath seen the grocer treat housemaids to his teas or crack a bottle of fish sauce or stand a man to cheese he sells us sands of araby as sugar for cash down he sweeps his shop and sells the dust the purest salt in town he crams the cans of poisoned meat poor subjects of the king and when they die by thousands why he laughs like anything the wicked grocer grosses in spirits and in wine not frankly and in fellowship as men in inns do dine but packed with soap and sardines and carried off by grooms for to be snatched by duchesses and drunk in dressing-rooms the hell instructed grocer has a temple made of tin and the ruin of good innkeepers is loudly urged therein but now the sands are running short from sugar of a sort the grocer trembles for his time 
just like his weight is short. Captain Dalroy was getting considerably heated with his nautical liquor, and his appreciation of Pump's song was not merely noisy, but active. He leapt to his feet and waved his glass. "'Ye ought to be poet laureate, Hump. Ye're right, ye're right. We'll stand all this no longer.' He dashed wildly up the sand slope and pointed with the signpost towards the darkening shore, where the low shed of corrugated iron stood almost isolated. "'There's your tin temple,' he said. "'Let's burn it!' They were some way along the coast from the large watering-place of Pebblewick, and between the gathering twilight and the rolling country it could not be clearly seen. Nothing was now in sight but the corrugated iron hall by the beach, and three half-built, red brick villas. Dalroy appeared to regard the hall and the empty houses with great malevolence. Look at it, said he. Babylon. He brandished the inn sign in the air like a banner, and began to stride towards the place, showering curses. In forty days, he called, shall Pebblewick be destroyed. Dogs shall lap the blood of J. Levison, secretary, and unicorns come back, Pat, cried Humphrey. You've had too much rum. Lions shall howl in its high places, vociferated the captain. Donkeys will howl anyhow, said Pump, but I suppose the other donkey must follow. And loading and untethering the quadruped, he began to lead him along. End of chapter 6